So it is um, noon Eastern. So let's kick things off um, and we'll likely have some more folks be joining us here on Zoom and LinkedIn as we go along. Um, my name is Michael Goldberg. I'm the executive director for the Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship here at Case Western Reserve University. I'm also a faculty member at Weatherhead, so I'm in my Weatherhead office. Um, we're thrilled to welcome um, Jill Byrne to our entrepreneurship speaker series. Um, she wears multiple hats. Um, uh, working with students, um, practicing nursing um, as a as a PhD graduate of um, of Case Western Reserve University, and, and as I'm sure we'll talk about today, has been um, dabbling in the world of entrepreneurship as well. So, Joe, we're thrilled to have you here today for this conversation. Um, all of our sessions are moderated by students, and and we're thrilled to have um, Nick Valenta, who's an undergraduate nursing student with his second um, moderation. He did such a great job the first time we brought him back. Um, Nick, thank you for, for agreeing to moderate today. Um, we're thrilled to have you here. Nick will sort of run the show. If you're on Zoom, please let the, Nick know um, if you have a question, just either raise your, your hand or, or Zoom hand or put something in the chat. Um, if you're watching on LinkedIn Live, just put something in the comments and I'll be monitoring and I'll be feeding that to Nick. So Jill, thank you for joining. Nick, thanks for moderating and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Mr. Goldberg. Uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be moderating yet another session, especially because I'm an undergraduate nursing student. I'm really excited to learn more about nursing innovation. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Jill Byrne to the session today. As a nurse in the operating room, Dr. Byrne recognized the struggles surgeons experienced as they operated, as they were expected to accurately perform surgery, wearing multiple layers of unbreathable PPE under bright lights and often became overheated. To improve the comfort of the operating team and ultimately patient safety, Dr. Byrne took matters into her own hands and developed a vest that surgeons could wear underneath their PPE to keep them cool. This device is now sold and used in healthcare facilities across the globe. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Byrne. Thank you for inviting me. This is a real pleasure to be able to tell um, the story, not only about the cooling vest, but about how important nurse-led innovation is. So to get started, could you tell us a little bit about your educational and career history? Sure. Um, I uh, have been a, a nurse uh, for many decades and um, most of that was spent at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, with any big healthcare organization, one of the advantages to all the consolidations and movements and closures of departments was the staff was able to move around. And I, I was able to take advantage of that. So not only I started out for many years in labor and delivery and then was able to move and um, work in internal medicine and then broaden my skills um, kind of back in surgery again um, about 12 years ago. And um, it was at that time that um, I noticed that considerable difference uh, coming back from an era when we wore uh, cloth and disposable um, PPE to um, just uh, that short amount of time, everything was now um, impervious and disposable and plastic. So there was a considerable difference in the comfort level. And um, so I was able to um, address that issue. So initially there was a strategic plan to develop the cooling vest. It was just spontaneously developed to address the um, high level of incivility and discomfort that I was seeing. So I um, went ahead and you know kept moving that idea forward. But in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, wow, there is such an opportunity here for research and really to identify these problems and to, um, I saw the difference that the staff I was working with, the comfort had changed, the civility was drastically improved and I thought, well, this is just a small population of people. Really, everybody needs to, to have this available to them. So um, it was that that encouraged me at that point. I thought, really, the only way I'm going to do this is if I go back to school. And I, uh, with a master's degree, worked on that for a couple of years. And then as I was finishing that, I met with the nurse leaders at Case and at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. And I was received very graciously. And they said, whatever we can do to help you, Jill, um, you need to be here. You need to move this idea forward. So I rolled right from one uh, program into the next and then um, completed um, my studies last year 
Um, and, um, and at that time too, once I finished um, collecting my data and my research, I was able to transition from the operating room then full-time into academia. Thank you so much for sharing. You know, you mentioned really something, a, a big event that happened during your career was the move to more disposable PPE. Were there any other moments or, or large, you know, shifts in policy during your career that really led to you developing the cooling vest? Um, initially, the development was really based at that time because it was 12 years ago, it was based on, on the reactions that I was seeing to the PPE. But I think now big events, um, it, it, historic, we see the, the impact the pandemic really has on the use of PPE. And fortunate for timing, I guess, in my research, identifies um, some of the disparities, but we're really, really fortunate because now PPE is used well outside the operating room. We're seeing it in intensive care units. And um, uh, even I, I've gotten calls from people from the lab um, who have to go to COVID floors. So really everyone in, in healthcare is impacted by um, the use of having to wear more layers of PPE and having to deal with those changes of comfort and um, reactions um, to um, the changes that individuals feel uh, being warm. Oh, that's great to hear that it's being used in additional settings uh, in, in addition to the operating room. So you, know, you mentioned a little bit as you transitioned into being a student again and kind of finding support for the development process there, what was the overall process for creating the best like? Um, I have found over the years that um, I've I always adapted back to the Rogers uh, theory of innovation. And it's a framework that's um, really beneficial in, in kind of telling the stories because the components um, at each level, um, for anybody that has an idea or an innovation, um, kind of breaking it down and looking at um, theoretically, uh, this particular theory um, really looks at sustainability. So as soon as you come up with an innovation or an idea, really, um, I was looking at how am I going to sustain this? How am I going to keep this going? How am I going to offer this to, to more populations outside of this little, little bubble that I was working in? So um, basically, the theory is communicated over time to a uh, social system, whether it's public, uh, professional, or organizational. Um, also, um, it has to be um, adopted by stakeholders, people that are going to be using it or um, interacting with it. And all of those things together really offer um, sustainability. So um, the five components, um, there's a relative advantage of the innovation, um, um, compatibility, and uh, complexity, trial ability, and observability. So when I, when I tell the story of the cooling vest, I, I kind of break it down to the relative advantage. Well, what does that mean? It's how is that uh, innovation perceived um, as better than the idea that it supersedes? So uh, the cooling vest was lightweight, it was flexible. Um, it was different than units, tethered um, cooling units that are available. They're very expensive units that are tethered to uh, machines, electric machines that pump uh, cold water through a vest and uh, surgeons would wear it, but they bought them personally on their own and they probably usually cost around $3,000. So they weren't available to the whole staff. Um, so the relative advantage of this innovation was that it was available to everyone. Um, it was relatively inexpensive and um, it was compatible. Um, it, is it compatible with the needs of the people that are adopting it? Yes, it was. Uh, these people um, no longer had to be complacent. You, you didn't have to accept the thermal discomfort that just came with the job. You knew that if you're going to be wearing all that PPE, you're going to be uncomfortable. You were probably going to be dehydrated by the end of the day. Well, now there was something simple. So it was very compatible with their needs. Um, people sweat so much sometimes that they would drip onto the surgical field or sometimes into the wound itself. And uh, how did we remedy that? Well, in the past, we wrapped foreheads in gauze to help soak up some of the perspiration. But um, the gauze sometimes would get so wet that it would kind of alter the visual field. Um, the one thing that we um, were able to do prior to the cooling vest, but now with the uh, cooling vest being available, 
because the body temperature really doesn't uh, get that high, there was a lot less sweating noticed and sweat soaked clothing. All of those things were, were improved. Um, looking at complexity is another component of the theory. So how simple is this to use? How um, easy is it for, well, it was, the cooling vest was terribly easy. All you had to do was put it on and put your ice in the pockets. Um, the ice packs were strategically placed. As simple as the innovation looks, I did a lot of research on where to put the ice, where am I gonna get the most effective cooling um, of those locations on the body that cool uh, core temperature down or skin temperature. Trialability. So um, how can an innovation be trialed and modified? Uh, modifications to any kind of idea is really important. Um, I had over the first five years when I was um, making this cooling vest at home on my own, cutting out all these um, paper drapes, I um, modified it and it had several iterations to the original design. Uh, and that was based on feedback from the staff as the staff would tell me, maybe we could, you know, move the pocket um, up a little higher. I felt like it was sagging into my waistline a little. So all of those things over the years, we, we addressed all of those issues. And then uh, by the time uh, the hospital innovations team, myself, and we partnered with a manufacturing company, we had done so many iterations to the vest that we were able to pretty much quickly move towards a product uh, trial. Um, so we went outside of the operating room to a lot of other places that had never had any exposure to the cooling vest during those five years. And we asked those people to use it. So it was used in uh, the NICU and in uh, uh, interventional radiology, those places where you know, individuals in healthcare are doing procedures and they're wearing a lot of PPE and they're really feeling the heat. So it was a new, a new thought to them. And based on their feedback, uh, the manufacturing company was really interested in moving the idea forward and beginning to manufacture it. Observability, uh, another component is really interesting because you look at how um, visual is this innovation um, and um, process idea um, to individuals that may be using it. Um, it was um, as intuitive as it was. It was just, you know, well, you show up and you're normally very warm. You put on this uh, simple vest with um, ice packs and you're comfortable throughout your surgery or performing the surgery. Um, so as, as simple as that sounds, it was so difficult sometimes for people to understand. Um, I remember a, a president of a hospital, a regional hospital system, who was also a surgeon came up to me and said, oh my gosh, Jill, I heard about your cooling vest. That's a great idea. When do you put it on the patient? And I, I, so it was again, it was, well, no, no, this isn't, we're so focused on patient care. This wasn't for the patients. This is um, basically addressing occupational health and well-being. This is for uh, the staff. And back, you think back 12 years ago, the staff weren't considered in that equation. It was still so patient-driven. And now post-pandemic, um, kind of post-pandemic, um, we're really looking at the well-being of healthcare workers. It's uh, finally um, being addressed. Um, so all of those things, really looking at any idea or innovation anybody might have, if you break it down and look at those components, those are all things that are really important and they're going to su support sustainability. That was a really great overview. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, you mentioned yourself, you know, cutting out those paper drapes and even asking your fellow staff members for their feedback. Uh, what other resources were available for you during the best development? Well, not only um, were the staff available to actually look at the product themselves. Um, that was a time when um, now uh, we've gotten the vest pretty much to the point where it's um, we've made as many iterations to it as we can. Um, we're working with a manufacturing company. So resources available at that time. Now I'm looking at, well, um, again, the sustainability idea. How are we going to sustain this? Well, the idea, um, moving that forward is really important. So looking to the academic leaders to help me with the research idea. Um, how can we put a research project together um, that will really um, highlight the benefits of cooling and really look at some of the disparities of occupational heat stress 
and not only for operating room personnel, but generalizable to many populations. So I had academic leaders that were uh, a great resource to me, the innovations team um, and um, it, within the healthcare institution, and then the industry and corporate leaders. So typically the, you see binary partnerships, you see partnerships between healthcare institutions and um, academia. Well, this was taking it a step further. This was actually a triangulation of organizations because we we also relied on the resources of the industry, uh, the corporate leaders. And we were often able to get together. Um, the corporate industry people were actually even able to bring in their marketing teams and their education teams. And we would you know, have meetings and brainstorm ideas. This was a completely new product. They didn't have this um, on a product line at all and how to move it effectively forward and and also uh, address they were so considerate of uh, the research and all those ideas that needed to be um, addressed but my role in that was actually pretty uh, interesting um, I was actually uh, an entrepreneur so um, I was the person within the company that's um, trying to help move an idea forward so I was able to connect um, some of these departments and bridge those gaps. Um, I was able to uh, establish the relationships, help build trust between these organizations. And in order to do that, I had to learn so many things outside of my comfort level, outside of nursing. I had to learn about data use agreement, uh, non-disclosure, uh, the ins and outs of the IRB, uh, conflict of interest. I was the inventor of the best, and now I'm going to be doing the research study on that. Uh, some people would have said, oh my gosh, you can't do that. Well, they did say that to me. And I said, well, no, I, I need to do this because um, I, I saw this. I know what I'm looking for. Um, and I had to, to uh, write uh, a, a lot um, on a conflict of interest um, plan and management plan, and that was accepted. So I was able to do the study. Uh, there was a lot of, of management and guardrails around certain things that um, I could do within the research. Um, the license agreements, that's sitting down with legal teams and interpreting a lot of the clinical things that they didn't understand. So there was really a lot to learn outside of that. And all of those were resources. And, um, and one of the things I, I was always interested in was their response. Um, it was... Um, very, the people were very interested, have stayed in touch with me all these years and uh, circle back to find out how were things going. Um, I was always really interested in this in the beginning and I just wanted to see where it's at now. So uh, those are those are all great resources. Again, um, having an idea, moving things forward. Don't be afraid to share, you know, your your ideas with um, with thought leaders to see where you can get things moved forward. That's great. Thank you. So you mentioned a little bit kind of about those management guardrails and those conflicts of interest with the IRBs. What other uh, challenges did you face throughout the process? And do, are any of those really specific to nursing innovation as a whole? Uh, yes, yes. I um, think uh, really looking at some of the characteristics of um, leadership and people that would help you um, move ideas forward. And I may have, I kind of gravitated towards people that um, were transparent and empathetic. Um, I had so many nurses come up to me over the years and say, I had an idea and I wanted to move it forward, but I was eliminated, you know, very early on. And once, you know, it's kind of the elephant in the room. Once um, the leaders heard about my idea, they, they moved it forward on their own. Um, it wasn't what I originally wanted it to be and, um, and, and perhaps didn't end up being sustainable for that reason because the original vision wasn't there, but it was maybe a good idea. Uh, somebody takes it. Um, some of the things that um, really need to be addressed, I think, um, more now in nursing as we develop these plans for innovation, people encouraging, engaging you know, people to come forward with ideas you really need to have those management plans in place. You know, you want to avoid unlawful authorship or you want to really, um, sometimes there's funding associated with things, uh, royalties. Um, people get in for sometimes the wrong reasons um, and try and take credit for something, um, to, for those reasons that, you know, maybe perhaps trying to gain some royalty aspect to 
an, an idea or an innovation. But I think if we had transparency and um, empathy in the beginning, and that was well established, I think people would feel more um, likely to move forward and engage to to move an idea um, or process forward. Wonderful. That's a that's a really good point about uh, being for the right reasons. That's that's for sure. It seems like you have a lot of passion for this topic, which is great. Uh, so kind of, you know, we started talking about, you know, nursing considerations, but are there really any considerations that individuals interested in healthcare innovation need to be aware of? Yes, I think besides um, just having a, an idea, product, process, um, you're also really where the the true innovation is is settled is is advocating for the change. That's that's a huge part, um, and really identifying some of those characteristics. Um, I, I've been doing like a, a lot of reading on uh, some. Um, studies that are done and um, tools and surveys that are being put together on the characteristics of people who are innovative. Um, some, um, especially like entrepreneurs, people within companies, you're looking at some people classify them as the creators, the doers, the implementers, and um, looking for the characteristics of those individuals and putting those individuals together to put for your project teams. Um, and uh, another book that um, I'm recently reading is Bolton and Thompson's. Uh, they've given a whole new title. It's called The Entirepreneur. So I was kind of breaking it down and looking at how can we identify people who are innovative and um, looking at propensity testing. How can we develop tests to identify people who have those certain characteristics and would we be able to, in the future, be able to, to group these people together um, for, in a sense, project teams to work on um, ideas and uh, products and uh, processes? Um, I was recently involved in a hackathon. I was at a conference and I signed up for an evening event. And I thought, well, I'm, gonna, I'm going to go to this just for the fact I want to see the individuals around my table to identify their characteristics and if I could pick out the, the creators and the doers. And um, so I, I, I sat back a little bit and really didn't offer much in the beginning, but then as it started to get like, wow, I think this is a really good idea. Then I, I, I fessed up and I told them my background and we actually were able to navigate an idea and we're still meeting on it because it is sounds like it's really something that this group wants to continue to pursue, but um, I, I, if anybody's interested, it's something I would very much like to, um, to look at in the future is that propensity testing, really identifying those characteristics and being able to um, move ideas forward. That's great, thank you very much. Uh, Jackie, I see your hand up. What would you like to ask? Yeah, I wanna jump in while we're on this topic. Um, I'd love to hear, Jill, how you think nurses are like uniquely positioned to innovate in healthcare, but also how our educational background outside of business might contribute to that. Yes, there's, um, we have so much to offer just because we, um, we continually have to utilize our educational backgrounds. And there's, um, that that ability to um, um, MacGyver it. nurses are always able to have those workarounds and those things. So we're we're taking a platform um, and we're we're able to to cross it over and use these interconnected partnerships. Um, kind of simply put, even in a unit, um, if you floated from one unit to the other you're able to, oh, wow, this group over here uses this product and this process, and they, you can introduce whole new ideas um, to, to other groups. So I think we're uniquely positioned as we um, student nurses, you see so many units, you're exposed to everything. And then you, you know, land that first job and you're, you're, you're using all those resources. So we, we continually build on that pyramid of experiences and um, we're able to really use um, a lot of now um, evidence-based. And um, if you wanna move an idea forward and you really wanna convince um, the audience in front of you that, that this is possible, do a little literature review, uh, get several ideas, find some theoretical framework, like 
like I've done several times throughout this journey, I've used some of those theories and I've, I've kind of adapted um, my um, explanation according to some of those tenets. And, and very quickly, you're able to maybe convey an idea a little easier than um, what some of the some of the grand entrepreneurs have said in the past when you're looking at some of the the stories of people who have told how difficult it was to get their idea out there but i think we're uniquely positioned because we we from the get-go those are things you're learning about evidence base and literature reviews and how to find that information so that you can uh, convey your idea i think um it also really stood out to me earlier when you mentioned having to advocate in order to get your for yourself but also to get your idea through the process um and getting your innovation to where you want it to be and i think that that's just interesting as well because in school it's so emphasized to us um the role of nurses as advocates within um, patient care as well so that maybe those same kind of skills could contribute to the business side is really interesting yes yes all right, we have two more questions here. Uh, so just the order they popped up. I can see uh, Emily, would you like to unmute and introduce yourself and ask your question? Hey, Hi, hey, Joe, good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, I'm Emily. Um, I am currently working at the VA as a quality scholar. And one of the issues that I think um, I have difficulty with is trying to, and, and you know, this may be just because of um, nursing background, it, I'm, I'm having uh, trouble trying to see how we can get stakeholder engagement and like bringing what I have to the table and making it be, you know, something that uh, stakeholders want to be a part of. So was there something that you um, experienced, Jill, or something that you found really effective in trying to get stakeholder engagement, especially when you have, you know, some really big players at hand? Yes. So I, just from what I, what I found is initially you can have an idea your stakeholders, you may have 50% or less that really understand the idea and really can, you know, join your team. And the other half, the very difficult um, uh, stakeholders to convince um, was, was my um, manufacturing company, the corporate leaders. There was no previous research or literature on occupational heat stress of surgical personnel and why they needed cooling vests. So I'm starting from scratch and I am looking at um, asking for a large grant to do a research study. And I'm also, they're, they're pretty convinced that they're gonna go ahead and manufacture the cooling vest. But so in order to, to move this forward, I used a theoretical background. I used SEAL's theory of stress and general adaptation syndrome. So it starts out alert phase, you know, adaptation as you, you start to get used to it. Um, and then the stage of exhaustion. So what I did was I highlighted those three, three phases of the theory. And I showed how initial, you know, we have initial response, sweating, profuse sweating, that kind of feels, starts to feel a little better and then the stage of exhaustion. Well, what happens when you've got a, a surgeon and surgical personnel around a, a field and they reach the stage of exhaustion? And what I could find in literature is it kind of happened after 80 minutes. Well, we know cases are hours long, so but we don't have any real data on cognitively, how are they responding after 80 minutes? What is happening to their bodies? What's happening to their thought process? What I could find in literature from firemen, from military was, um, they had memory issues, um, uh, decision making. There was a lot of impulsivity. So if you're making an impulsive decision while you're cutting tissue, um, could that be bad? Yes. So I I used that theory and I, I used all of the other resources from other industries and other studies that were done and I put together a presentation. And I remember saying to the vice president of the, the healthcare manufacturing company, which is global, uh, worldwide, I said to him, you know, it's like tires on your car. You got to replace them after 20,000 miles. But what we don't have is we can't replace our brain after it's been um, 20,000 miles. We just have to live with the, the damage that is done day after day to, to individuals that, that could potentially be suffering from heat stress. I just remember the look on his face, his eyes got so big thinking, oh my gosh, uh, you're right. So when they went back to the table and they, they heard of all the 
problems that could be resulting from the heat stress, that there could be memory issues there, which I saw, I said to them, um, not all the time surgeons leave the field, they go to the computer to put orders in. And it, occasionally I'm getting a call from the pharmacist to say, mm, doctor just put orders in and he clicked on the wrong drug. Or could you go get them and tell them to fix that? Or radiology calls. Um, want to follow up x-ray on the hip that they just operated, but they put in a right shoulder. Could you go have them clarify that? So you see those memory issues happening after the heat stress. So I, I used all those examples to the big stakeholders and um, it took a little bit of time, but they eventually, they eventually felt it was important enough that they funded the study. I hope that helps. No, yeah, it's it's definitely helps. I just think, you know, as nurses having some sort of class or business, you know, foundation is super helpful because you have to know who your stakeholders are. If they're looking at cost and you're presenting to them, you know, patient outcomes, they might not care. So I think that's nice that you kind of used a little bit of everything uh, to, to, you know, pull a little bit of strings from each side. So thanks so much. Sure. And on the cost issue, I... I have found that I'm always reluctant, be reluctant to bring a cost value into something that you're presenting for the first time, because we don't know, we don't know the cost value. And it's, there are so many other important things to address first, sometimes the unknown and uh, what we do know from other studies. Um, as we learned from um, our good friend, Dr. Voss, uh, when we were learning our research, um, uh, presentations, he always said, hit him with that big, bad question at the end of your presentation. So my big, bad question was uh, to these thought leaders was, we don't know, but we know this affects memory. And could this, um, over time, people that are working in these industries over 20 years, could, could this be an explanation for some of the early onset dementias we're seeing? So rather than to, to jump into a cost, unless you have very um, good data in front of you. Um, go for some of the unknown things that would line up well, or go for um, other um, studies that are done in other industries. That was a great discussion. Thank you so much, Emily and Dr. Byrne. Uh, Scott, what's your question? Uh, first, I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Byrne. It's really inspiring to hear how you've kind of gone through every stage of the innovation process. And uh, yeah, that's super applicable, I think, to many of us in the audience. Uh, one thing that I've, I found especially interesting as you've um, talked is hearing about, number one, the need to get your idea out there on the one hand, but then also sometimes what happens is people who are in other positions will take the ideas of entrepreneurs and innovate them kind of by themselves. And the person with the original idea gets left by the wayside. How did you achieve that balance? How did you get your idea out there and get the support that you needed to make the idea happen while still maintaining intellectual property, while still maintaining kind of control over the vision of the project and not having somebody beat you to market or steal your idea. Right. Um, it, it was um, strategic. Uh, I was, you know, um, completely vulnerable in the beginning and I shared my idea, I was excited. I'm getting such good feedback. Everybody loves this. We need to move this forward. And, um, and then you, you hit your first brick wall. And there's a lot of naysayers out there, a lot of people that are you know, interested in the well-being of healthcare workers. Um, there, there was those responses. And then I, I, I quickly started to learn, what am I doing this for? I'd, I'd ask myself that question about 10 times a day. What am I really doing this for? I am doing this to improve the well-being of human beings. And sometimes the more I was pushed back or the more I was told no, the harder I fought. Um, I had to navigate. And then I quickly learned about those characteristics, which are so important to me about transparency and empathy and building that trust relationship with people. So I did align myself with people I could trust. And if people right, right away started talking about dollars or royalties or um, those things, that was a flag. That was a big red flag. I, I, so I avoided it because there was no guarantee on anything. And um, I, I didn't make that the focus, which a lot of people that'll come to me and ask for advice, I'll say, if you're just looking for 
royalties or money out of something, then you probably have something that's not going to be sustainable. So you may get some quick few dollars or you know, be able to sell your idea for $5,000. But if you're really looking at preserving or um, helping the well-being of human beings, and you're looking at sustaining something and really moving something that's really going to make a difference forward, um, you just have to be vested in the interest of doing that. And not if anything else is, is um, um, an additional, you know, royalties or anything like that is, is a pleasant surprise. Um, it isn't always easy to navigate those relationships. And um, I actually then, as I got stronger and more confident in what I was doing and more vested in the interest of, of improving the well-being of all these people that I, I was so passionate now in helping. Um, and it was, I, I tell a quick story about uh, a young surgeon. Uh, I, I was at a, a regional hospital that wasn't the one I worked in and um, saw a doctor that I worked with and he had made arrangements to get a cooling vest for this young resident. And he said to him, pointed at me and he said, there she is right over there. She invented that cooling vest. And so this, this young man, he's probably all of you know 22, comes running up to me, gives me the big bear hug. And he said, you saved my life. I was going to quit medicine. I wanted to be a surgeon since I was a young kid. But once I sat down and I was sweating, I knew I wasn't going to be able to do this. And the doctor, the attending he was working with made arrangements for him to get a cooling vest. And he just, he walked around with this cooling vest and his packs of ice, every hospital that he was um, rotated to so that he could perform his surgeries and without worrying about sweating into everything. So um, it was people like that, that you meet along the way that, you know, you made a huge difference in their life that I kept going forward and I kept navigating some of those uncomfortable relationships that I had. And then I got more comfortable, more confident. And I would actually say to some of the team members, this is what we have to do. This is the next step on how we have to navigate past some of these barriers. And I, I would do this a lot, like, okay, I hope this works. Um, and, um, and then we would, you know, move something forward. So trial and error, uh, determination and um, and reminding yourself about 25 times a day, you know, why are you really doing this? So I hope that helps. Yeah. No, that's very helpful. And, it, and at each stage, kind of when you were moving forward with this team, how did you, or I guess even before you had a team, how did you figure out what the next step to take was, right? How did you figure out when to reach out to innovations or how to deal with the legal stuff or how to learn about intellectual property? How did, how did you even kind of know what next step to take or learn what next step to take? So as, I think as sometimes as you, as you meet some challenges and then I start to look to see where, where is it breaking down? Where is the communication breaking down? And as I said earlier, boy, just sometimes communicating those ideas. Um, I, I remember I uh, was sent, um, it was probably about 45 pages long, um, for the patent application. And um, I, I think one of the challenges was I heard, well, there's already cooling vests out there, disposable, or they were mostly reusable. There's cooling vests out there. Why would the patent office think that your idea is any different than what already what's out there? So, so I um, read all 45 pages of this um, application and it, it detailed and it's, again, it's, it's not anatomy, physiology, and uh, psychology that I'm so used to reading many articles about. It was difficult, and I had to look up a lot of uh, terms and uh, sent a lot of questions back to the attorneys. But what I, I looked at is they, I had um, the way I had the pockets angled on the vest in the patent um, description. They said, oh, so that's so when you bend over, um, you can bend over the ice packs. And I thought, why did you just assume that that they just put that in there themselves? So back to um, the attorneys and I said, no, that's aligned with the intercostal spaces. That's going to protect organs. And, you know, and I, then I looked at and I sent them literature and articles on, on specific areas of our body and our torso that have more optimal cooling. So they included all of that into um, into the application and um, and it went through no problem. So um it was, it was things like that, that those little red flags, things I wasn't familiar with and I had to get very familiar with quickly. Um, a lot of work. Um, every time I saw one of those flags, 
investigate where it was coming from and what I could do to, to get past it. Thank you so much, Dr. Byrne. Uh, Beth, what is your question? Hi, Beth. Hi, Jill. <laughs> um, I just had a question sort of to piggyback off of Scott's question. So like when you were, you're at your employer and then you're at CASE and um, I think you mentioned applying for funding and such, did you find that any specific um, organizations like wouldn't have allowed you to proceed with your intellectual property or like how did you sort of navigate keeping it as your own rather than like the funding agencies or the companies does that make sense so those, yeah yeah that's um those those are all steps um so the the intellectual property um was tied into the patent so then the next step is is to work with the manufacturing company so this is already in place and so there's two patent applications out. There's a design patent and a utility patent for um, a garment. And so both of those are in place. And so now enters the manufacturing company. And since they have picked up the license agreement and, um, and, uh, and are manufacturing the vest, they then in turn were able to put more patents on the cooling vest itself. And each of those, like I don't own the patent. Um, the Cleveland Clinic owns the patent. But I always explain that is that's going to be typical. It's like Michael Jackson's music. It's always going to be Michael Jackson's music, but somebody can, can purchase it. So the same with this, um, this patent. It's owned by the organizations that an individual may work for that when they create an innovation, their name is on it. My name is on the patent, uh, but it be, can be owned by you know, somebody else. Thank you so much, Dr. Byrne. We are just about out of time here. So now we're going to turn things back over to Mr. Goldberg and we'll give a wrap up. Great. Um, Nick, great job moderating. I really appreciate it. Um, you are a natural at this. You know, maybe you've got to, you're going to have to get out of nursing and do a, and you're going to, maybe, maybe it could be a nursing related talk show. Well, to combine your, your skills um, that you're learning here with obviously what is becoming a great skill of moderating. Um, so thank you for doing this. Um, Jill, thank you for joining. Loved hearing about the journey. Um, so many interesting um, insights, I think, that you've had that are um, applicable to a lot of our folks from the nursing community, but, but more broadly, the entrepreneurship community. It's, it's really wonderful having a partnership with um, our folks at the nursing school to, to highlight stories like yours and um, really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. Great. Um, good to see everybody. We have one more event next week. Travis Brooks, um, who is an alum formerly at Yelp, now at Netflix, some little company doing something in the entertainment space is going to be here um, next Wednesday. So hope to see those of you that are interested. And thanks again to everybody for joining. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you.